Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is Melvin Leffler. Mel is co-chair of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program Advisory Board and Emeritus Professor at American of American History at the University of Virginia. Mel is also the author of several books on the Cold War and U.S. relations with Europe, including his latest, Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq. Mel, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the center and congratulations on the new book. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to join you on this dialogue. Uh, as I think you know, I've spent several years or several different intervals at the Wilson Center over my career and uh, the research I've done there has been instrumental for several of my books. So I'm very indebted to the Wilson Center. Well, you know, it's a uh, associations with people like you are what make the Wilson Center what it is. So right back at you, Mel. Thank you. Uh, speaking of high praise, uh, let me share with our viewers what Eric Edelman had to say about the book. And you'll tell us about him and his role with the book, uh, uh, with the writing of the book, because I know you consider him to be instrumental in that regard. And just for people who don't know, among the many high-level posts Edelman has held. One was as Principal Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Cheney. And here's what he said about Mel Leffler's new book. He's, he said he's written the most balanced and dispassionate account of the Bush administration's policies towards Iraq. Henceforth, all serious studies of the Iraq war will start here. The book should be read by scholars, policymakers, and anyone interested in understanding the decision-making uh, that was untainted and that the book is untainted by partisan bias. Terrific praise. Uh, I'm music to any author's ears. Uh, I'm sure you loved hearing that. I, I, I did indeed. And um, what especially has pleased me is that uh, various readers from all over the political spectrum, left, right, center, have all deemed the book a pretty objective account. Uh, and, um, and I take great satisfaction in that. I wanted to tell a compelling story. I wanted to demonstrate that the invasion of Iraq was not inevitable, um, that there was a lot of contingency involved. And I also wanted to analyze with a good deal of clarity uh, why the invasion, liberation, and occupation went awry at the end. So uh, the aim is to uh, explain a very complicated story that was not inevitable. Well, I think mission accomplished on all of those points. And and I would, would also say that uh, uh, on the concept of fair and balanced approach, you don't pull any punches in your conclusions and your analysis. I mean, you don't walk this tightrope of sort of mealy mouth analysis pretty hard hitting, but as all of the reviewers have said, you manage to be fair in the process of doing so. Yes, I try very hard uh, to illuminate both the motivations of the of President Bush and his advisors, and also at the same time to step back and critique them. So what I hope this book conveys is both empathy and understanding for the decision makers, um, as well as an ability to critique what they did. And uh, in the conclusion, as you say, I try to, to explain both the attributes of the decision making process and the glaring problems that were inherent in it as well. Before we dig into the story itself, I'd like to pull back the curtain and give our, our listeners and viewers a peek into the whole process. How long it took you to write the book, how many interviews you had, not just access to dozens of top officials, but also declassified U.S. and U.K. documents. Tell us about the, the writing process, the discovery process. Well, uh, I, be, I began thinking about this book um, seriously in 2008 um, as a result of a uh, so accidental lunch with Eric Edelman, uh, who I had not ever met before, um, but he was visiting the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, where I had an association. And uh, through some friends, um, a lunch was set up between the two of us. Uh, Eric was a professional foreign service officer who, as you said, um, had very high level positions um, serving both in Democratic and Republican administrations. He had been 
an assistant to Strobe Talbot during the Clinton years, and then a very high level assistant to uh, Vice President Cheney um, during the Bush years. And then he went on after that to be the uh, Under Secretary of Defense. Well, we sat down uh, to lunch and, um, you know, we started talking. Eric, who had received a PhD in history uh, at Yale uh, 30 or 40 years before, um, was to my surprise, intimately familiar with my work, uh, all my work that I had done on the Cold War. And um, he asked me what I was doing at the present time. And I said, I was finishing up another book um, uh, about uh, the evolution of the, of the Cold War. And I mentioned to him that, you know, while I had been at Oxford in 2002, 2003, I had given an important lecture on the impact of 9-11 in American foreign policy. And Eric said to, said to me, uh, Mel, why don't, why don't you write a serious book um, about uh, the Bush administration and um, it, the dynamics that led to the intervention uh, in, in Iraq? And I smiled and I said, well, I, I'd like to do that, Eric, um, except, um, you know, unlike all the books I've written on the Cold War, there will be very few declassified documents that I would have available. And Eric said, well, that was a serious impediment, um, but that if I embarked on the process, uh, he would arrange interviews with, for me with many of his former colleagues who had worked in the administration. Well, um, as I note in the preface to the book, I didn't take the statement all that seriously. I didn't really uh, know if Eric would do that. And I really didn't know if I had the gumption and uh, the, the readiness to go and start um, dealing with all these very high level advisors to presidents and vice presidents. But to my amazement, um, a couple of weeks later, uh, Eric wrote me and said that um, if I wanted to, he would set up interviews for me with, uh, with Paul Wolfowitz, who had been the deputy secretary of defense and um, with Steve Hadley, who had, at, during the first Bush administration, was the deputy national security advisor. And before I knew it, the interviews were set up and I began speaking to some of these high level uh, advisors. And um, for about a dozen years, or really a good 10 years after that, I would meet with um, many of the highest level officials in the Bush administration, virtually everyone uh, of importance, except the president himself. I never had the opportunity um, to interview uh, uh, Pres President Bush, but Vice President Cheney, Secretary of State Powell, et cetera, et cetera, I interviewed. But at the same time, I always knew and was very, very cognizant of the fact that these very adept policymakers might be much better at spinning me than I would be at questioning <laughs> them. And so I made a commitment to myself um, not, to, not to write a book based on interviews. Uh, the interviews would help, uh, but that I would do everything possible um, to try to get as many declassified documents as I could. And I was lucky in, in two ways. Um, first, that um, the British conducted an exhaustive parliamentary study uh, of, the, uh, of, of the decision of to Prime Minister Tony Blair to take Britain to war on the side of the Americans and George W. Bush. Um, that, that inquiry had nothing to do specifically with American policymaking, but it was an exhaustive inquiry um, with interviews of hundreds of officials and with the publication of really dozens and dozens and dozens of, um, of, uh, of critical documents. And so I was able to examine those documents and learn from them a lot about conversations with high level um, Bush administration officials. So I could learn about the discussions between Con Condoleezza Rice George W. Bush's national security advisor and David Manning, Tony Blair's. Um, there were, you know, David Manning was interviewed at length, and there were many documents regarding his meetings uh, with with Condi Rice. At the same time, um, 
during these years um, when I was working on the book, um, captured Iraqi documents, um, not by any means all of them, just a small portion um, were declassified and some of them were translated into English. I do not read Arabic, but I read many of the translated uh, documents that helped to illuminate over the 1970s, 80s, 90s, um, the dynamics of decision-making inside Iraq and illuminated a, a fair amount about uh, Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein. So one of the things I tried to do in the book in those first two chapters was to write uh, some compelling narratives, uh, short, uh, uh, that describe Saddam Hussein and his rise to power, and then a chapter on George, a short chapter on George W. Bush uh, and what he was like and what he had accomplished um, prior uh, to his assumption of the presidency. And their pack backgrounds couldn't be more different. One born into essentially poverty, the other a child of privilege. And, and the book tells that story quite well. Let me, let me ask you this, Mel. You know, you've heard the old adage uh, that uh, journalists, we get to write the first draft of history, but then the real heavy hitters, the historians come in and they write the more definitive versions. And But but historians like yourself, uh, still, you start with that first draft of history, right? That's what you knew about the story. So as you started your process of writing the book and the interviews and the, the meticulous going over of documents from these various sources, I don't want to give away everything because we want people to read the book, but tell us about what's, what surprising things started to turn up for you that begin began to either change the narrative or at least broaden it into a more three-dimensional uh, uh, story? Well, um, to begin with, what surprised me uh, in terms of the literature that, or the journalistic literature that, that existed, uh, was the central role of President Bush himself. Because in, in many of the, of the journalistic narratives, um, especially the critical ones um, uh, coming from, from um, people uh, on, on the left, was to really ignore the role of Bush or to minimize it and to highlight um, the influence of traditional nationalist conservatives like um, Dick Cheney himself or Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, or on the other hand, um, the journalists, um, both on the left and the right, um, all, all journalists very much um, were inclined to highlight the role of neoconservatives like Paul Wolfowitz and, and, and Doug Fife, who was the undersecretary of defense. So one of the things that I really found surprising um, when I looked carefully at the documents and started talking to the policymakers was the acknowledged role of George W. Bush as the key decision maker. I must say that as a historian who's worked on many other administrations, I was not at all surprised by this. I mean, in, a, in, in, a, in American decision-making, I had learned that the president is always the determinative factor. Um, he's not usually manipulated, almost never simply manipulated uh, by, by advisors and, and assistants. And, um, the um, journalistic literature, I thought, um, overstated the role of neoconservatives and overstated the role of Dick Cheney and, and Donald Rumsfeld in terms of the basic decision-making uh, with regard to Iraq uh, and, 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 to the, um, and to the occupation of Iraq um, after the invasion. So, so one critical aspect was, um, was uh, the role of George W. Bush. Another very important and unexpected uh, finding based on the literature that existed um, was that the decisions were far more contingent than most or than many journalists had, had explained. What I, what I found um, to my surprise was, first of all, Iraq was not an overwhelming preoccupation of President Bush and his top advisors when he assumed office. One of the first questions uh, 
I asked all my interviewees was simply the very um, sort of innocuous question of uh, what was most on your mind when you took office? I didn't say was a rock on your mind. I purposefully didn't say, didn't say that. I, I just wanted them to talk expansively about, you know, what was most on their mind when they took office. And v almost no one said a rock as a, as a key preoccupation. And then when I started looking at the documents, um, that became uh, very evident to me. So one of the per pervasive views in the journalistic literature that the administration came in determined you know, to go to war in Iraq, um, I found to be untrue. Um, what, what, um, what was clear, of course, was that there was great pre that there was a preoccupation uh, with Saddam Hussein. Um, it was clear that President Bush himself had very strong attitudes about Saddam Hussein, uh, but this was not an over an overriding priority. And in that respect. 9/11 uh, uh, was a was a really determinative event. Mm -hmm. So you, you, President Bush, decides on this strategy that you refer to as coercive diplomacy, which essentially, in my reading of the uh, of the book, uh, backs him into a corner because if that doesn't work, you look weak if you don't respond militarily. Uh, describe to our viewers what coercive diplomacy is and what the implications were of that decision by the president. Uh, that's a wonderful question because the, the theme of coercive diplomacy uh, runs through the whole second half uh, of my book. And um, so once the policymakers decided um, to focus on Iraq after 9-11. And I, I, I'd like to come back at, uh, and, and address why they came to focus uh, on Iraq after 9-11, because that's a key part of my story. Um, but, uh, but once they had decided it, by December 2001 um, to focus uh, on Iraq, um, President Bush wanted to wanted to explore different ways of, of dealing with the regime of Saddam Hussein. And um, they certainly looked once again, as had been done for many years, into the possibility of covert action to overthrow him. And they pretty much uh, agreed uh, that that was not a, a, a likely possibility. So the I idea of coercive diplomacy was to mobilize um, a mobilize US forces and ultimately a coalition of forces and try to intimidate Saddam Hussein into making concessions. So one of so that's what co coercive diplomacy is. Use military force um, to um, to compel Saddam Hussein to make concessions. And the diplomacy, Essentially, intimidation. What you're describing is right. intimidation. Yeah. Right, right, and um, and the the hope um, was that either uh, through military intimidation, Saddam Hussein might flee. He might just decide to leave. Um, uh, through in military intimidation, some of the high level military officials might decide. This is the right time to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Let's get rid of him, and they might just assass assassinate him. Um, but ultimately, you know, the main hope would be that um, that and and thereby they would bring about regime change. Um, but another hope was that coercive diplomacy might actually compel Saddam Hussein to open up Iraq for inspections. And um, and the preoccupation of high level officials was that Saddam Hussein had used weapons of mass destruction in the past, meaning uh, biological and chemical weapons. He had used used them in the past. Um, he had lied about them and he had been actively developing them through much of the 1990s. Um, 
late in the 90s, as a result of the inspections, um, he gave up most of his, and pro probably in retrospect, all of, of his efforts to develop uh, these weapons, but he threw out the inspectors in 1998. And so there had been no inspections for three and a half years or such. And so part of the objective of coercive diplomacy was to, was to convince Saddam Hussein that he should allow back the inspectors. And um, what I emphasize in the book and what's a critical part of the book is that there, was, there, were, there were goals to coercive diplomacy, explicit goals, regime change, weapons of mass destruction. But as I illuminate, there was not clarity about which of these two goals was the number one priority, weapons of mass destruction or regime change. Um, and ultimately the, the diplomacy part was securing the support of other nations to, to expedite passage of, a UN resolu of another UN resolution that would force Saddam Hussein to open up or face military, open up his country to the inspectors again, or face mil military action. Um, and what was interesting, and what I found once again, um, that was different than what existed in most of the literature, was George W. Bush's decision, sincere decision, in in my opinion, um, to work uh, thoughtfully. Um, to get this, to get this UN, to get this resolution passed through the through the United Nations, and with an understanding um, that should he get the resolution passed, should Saddam open up uh, Iraq for inspections, should there be clarity that either Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction or that he would relinquish, clearly relinquish those weapons of mass destruction that he actually possessed. Um, should he do all these things, Bush seemed to be sincere in saying, okay, that would constitute in effect regime change. And although I don't like it, thought Bush, and he said that uh, numerous times, that's not really what I would like. I'd like to get rid of Saddam Hussein, I would like regime change. That has been the policy of the United States since 1998, regime change. But if Saddam opened up Iraq to the inspectors and complied with these requirements, um, I would, I, George Bush, would be willing to work with him, would be willing to accept him in power. The, the book is filled with the voices of those who either directly or indirectly influenced all of these decisions, whether on the U.S. side, Dick Cheney or Paul Wolfowitz or Donald Rumsfeld on the international side, Hans Blix and Tony Blair. I'll come back to him because you have a whole chapter about that special relationship between the United States and the UK and how Blair and Bush come together on this and seemingly bonding on their personal disdain for Saddam Hussein. Which leads me to the question, Mel, about how much in a story like this do such personal feelings come into play when people are making big geopolitical decisions? Uh, I think the relationship between um, Tony Blair and uh, and and George Bush uh, was was very consequential in terms of the of the process. I think um, that Bush. Um, was wary of acting unilaterally. I think he felt uh, that it was both strategically and politically desirable to have key allies. Um, and Tony Blair uh, appeared very much to be the uh, to be an ally an ally with a kindred spirit. Um, they both, as as you correctly say, really loathed. Saddam Hussein uh, for the brutality, 
that he had exercised inside Iraq and for his behavior in terms of starting two major wars, um, having developed weapons of mass destruction, having used them. They look with great uh, disdain upon this. And that, that relationship was important, as I explained, because I think Tony Blair was the determinative influence in shaping President Bush's willingness to go to the UN for, for another resolution, which he did in September of, two, of 2002. And it seems from the evidence um, that is now available that when Blair said to Bush, as Blair did several times, if Saddam really does comply, we do not expect him to comply. But if he does comply, we are going to have to accept yes for an answer. And Blair seems to have said that, quote, repeatedly. And Bush grudgingly acknowledged that he, he would accept that. And so Blair is very critical um, in terms of, of shaping the process that that, impel, that inclines George W. Bush to go back to the United Nations and to really conduct the diplomatic aspect of coercive diplomacy, that is securing, trying to secure a UN resolution. And there is um, a great deal of effective diplomacy that is conducted in September and October uh, and early November of 2002 in which the United States works very hard, along with the British, to actually get the Security Council to pass a unanimous resolution calling for inspections. And during that process, what's interesting is that um, George W. Bush again and again makes concessions in order to secure uh, a, a unanimous resolution. And I might say concessions that two of his closest advisors really dislike both Vice President Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld are very clear in, in communicating to Bush that they do not like all these concessions he's making, but he does make them. I, I wanna to talk to you a bit about uh, some of your conclusions and ultimately you, you challenge the the pop history version of events in which George Bush is essentially a puppet to other players in the administration. Uh, and the book makes clear that that's not the case at all. But you end up saying the president was fearful, well-intentioned, but pull, uh, poorly informed. And in your concluding chapter, uh, you use the words fear, power, and hubris as defining of how things unfolded. I explain that to us. What, what were these factors and how do they lead to what ultimately is viewed as a mistake when it comes to U.S. foreign policy? Right. I mean, um, th those are the three great themes of my book, fear, power, hubris, along with uh, an another factor, which I would simply say was dysfunction, uh, mm -hmm. organiza organizational, organizational and administrative uh, dysfunction. But the fear factor was the preoccupation with the likelihood of another terrorist attack, um, this time with weapons of mass destruction, another terrorist attack after the upheaval uh, of 9-11. On and the I, US, I, on the US homeland. On the on the US homeland. And yeah. you know, I, I have a chapter, um, a key early chapter of the book is simply on 9-11 and the impact 9-11 had and the fears that persisted after 9-11 about the inevitability of another attack. Almost everyone believed there would be uh, another attack, and there was very good reason uh, to believe that. So the worry is about another attack on, on, on the American homeland. Uh, that's that's the, the fear factor. The, the, the attention gravitates to Iraq in November and December of 2001, because after the Taliban um, regime is dislodged in Afghanistan and American 
military and covert officers move into the terrorist camps that had existed, the Al-Qaeda camps that had existed in Afghanistan, they find clear evidence, unmistakable evidence, that Al-Qaeda was looking to develop weapons of mass destruction and to secure weapons of, of, of mass destruction. The attention gravitates to Iraq at that very point in time because Iraq had had and was known to have developed biological and chemical weapons. This fear is tremendously reinforced during this fall of 2001, right after 9-11, by the fact by the fact that there is a tremendous anthrax scare inside the United States. That is to say, letter, letters um, with anthrax spores are disseminated in the mail. Nobody knows the, you know, where, where they came from. Um, but there is, and, and six or eight people are killed. Office buildings are closed down. The Supreme Court has to move to, a, to another place um, within the Wilson Center where you're operating. Um, mail was was interfered with, et cetera, et cetera. So there is tr tremendous amount of fear and attention naturally, I show, gravitates to Iraq, who has in the past developed and used chemical and, bi and, bi and biological weapons. Power is another theme of the book. And that is policymakers believed that the United States had the power to dislodge the regime, to over to bring about a regime change, if they had the fortitude to use that power. After the success they experienced in Afghanistan, the unanticipated quick success in overthrowing the Taliban regime, this tremendously increased the temptation to think that they could also succeed in Iraq. And so the the consciousness of of an Ameri of American power is a very very key factor. The hubris, the hubris, is the ideological belief um, that the United States represents a superior way of life uh, based on free people, religious freedom, private markets, free enterprise. That the United States represents a superior way of life that had demonstrated its superiority in the wars against fascism and communism. And that when the United States would invade Iraq, the pervasive belief was that the Iraqis would wel welcome uh, American soldiers with, uh, what do they say? Greeted as liberators. We greeted would, greeted as, as liberators, liberators with, yeah. with, 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 fla with flowers and sweets. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iraqi exiles told that. So those are three key themes, fear, power, hubris, um, that uh, shape the administration's thinking. And then I also spend a lot of time, as, as you know, um, explaining the dysfunction uh, within the administration and um, and the feuding within the administration, feuding that had very significant repercussions in terms of the way the liberation and occupation of Iraq uh, were handled. And ultimately, as as you intim as you intimated, uh, John, I hold uh, you know I hold the president responsible uh, for the for this dysfunction. Uh, with within his his administration, interestingly enough, a, as I explain, most of the people who worked for George W. Bush really liked him, truly respected him, thought of him as a good leader, but a, witnessed the fact that he was disciplined, um, probing, um, not necessarily altogether curious, but asked good questions. Um, so his advisors, to my a little bit to my surprise, um, ha had very, very positive things to say about him. But then when you look at the record of dysfunction, which I try to illuminate in great detail, it shows that um, he did not exert his leadership um, in, as an, an, as, in as an effective way um, 
as was necessary and required by the enormous undertaking um, that he engaged in. Well, it's a, a masterful piece of work, uh, Mel. Congratulations on a, an important story well told. You and others refer to it as the most important foreign policy choice of the entire post-Cold War era, with with pending decisions on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, perhaps uh, unfortunately trumping that. But uh, thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage our viewers, you've heard just a piece of the story. Please read the book, which is Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq. Mel Leffler, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Enjoy talking about it. <laughs> great. And great to have you back at the Wilson Center, even if just virtually. Thank you. Uh, for more on, on Mel and his book, also, I should tell you to visit the History and Public Policy page. You mentioned Christian Osterman earlier. There'll be other uh, events uh, around Mel's book here at the Center. So again, to our viewers, hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for your time and interest.